At Boscombe Down Airfield in early 1944, the wind carried the scent of fuel, wet grass, and cold aluminum. Mechanics in oil-stained overalls tightened panels on a gleaming Spitfire MK-21, its nose hiding a prototype engine whose power exceeded anything previously fitted to the aircraft. The new Griffin 85 roared like a contained storm, its twin contra-rotating propellers shimmering under the gray English sky. The men working around it knew they were preparing a machine that many within the air ministry had privately called a waste of resources. Yet for chief designer Joseph Smith, this flight was more than a test. It was a verdict on months of work that could decide whether his stupid idea would rescue or ruin Britain's most famous fighter. Test pilot Jeffrey Wellham climbed the ladder, face calm but eyes alert. He had flown dozens of Spitfire variants, but never one that looked quite like this. Two massive propeller discs spinning in opposite directions, a mechanical gamble intended to cancel out the brutal torque that had plagued earlier Griffin-powered marks. With the control tower signal, Wellam brought the throttles forward. The Griffin thundered to life. To everyone's astonishment, the Spitfire tracked straight down the runway without the usual rudder wrestling. The takeoff was smooth, controlled, almost effortless. For a fleeting moment, Smith allowed himself to believe the skeptics had been wrong. But at altitude, when Wellam pushed past 300 miles per hour, the transformation began. The airframe shuddered faintly, then more violently. Instruments blurred as vibration rippled through the cockpit. At 370 miles per hour, the control stick trembled uncontrollably. Every rib, spar, and bearing seemed to resonate in protest. The aircraft that had climbed like an arrow was now shaking itself apart in the thin February air. Wellam throttled back, voice steady but taut over the radio. Boscombe Control. Test 27 experiencing severe vibration. Returning for emergency landing. On final approach, the modified Spitfire descended faster than expected, heavy from its altered aerodynamics. Wellam fought to keep the glide path, easing her down on the damp runway. When the wheels touched, the vibration ceased, but so did the momentary pride of innovation. As the engine wound down, the crowd that had once buzzed with anticipation now stood silent. The machine had worked, until it hadn't. Around the field, Smith felt the weight of the moment settle over him. Six months of calculation, machining, and faith now teetered on the edge of failure. Yet even amid the disappointment, a single fact stood out. The aircraft had flown straighter than any Spitfire before it. Inside Hangar 7, the mood was colder than the February air outside. The modified Spitfire sat silent under the arc lamps, its twin propellers frozen mid-motion, symbols of both brilliance and failure. Around the aircraft, engineers and officers gathered in a half-circle, the echo of their boots mixing with the faint ping of cooling metal. The emergency meeting had been called just two hours after the test flight. Joseph Smith stood in the center, his hands clasped behind his back, awaiting the judgment that might end the most ambitious engineering gamble of his career. At the far end of the table sat Air Commodore Sorley, a ministry representative known for his impatience with experimental programs. He had driven down from London the moment the preliminary report reached Whitehall. His presence turned what should have been a technical debrief into something closer to a tribunal. Squadron Leader Wellam, Sorley began, voice measured. Please give us your assessment. Wellam's flight suit was still damp from sweat, his tone professional but edged with fatigue. Sir, the contra-rotating propellers completely eliminated torque reaction during takeoff and climb. Handling below 300 miles per hour was excellent, possibly the best I've flown in any Spitfire. A murmur rippled through the engineers. Despite the rough landing, the early results sounded like vindication. But Wellam wasn't finished. His eyes darkened as he continued. Above 370 miles per hour, vibration increased rapidly. The entire airframe began to resonate. I feared structural failure. Climb performance dropped sharply. At full power, she behaved like she was throttled back. The silence that followed was heavy. Smith's pulse thudded in his temples. He had solved one problem only to create another one that might destroy the aircraft entirely. Chief Engineer Charles Lithgow shuffled through his clipboard. Ground tests showed mild harmonics at certain RPMs, 
but nothing like what happened in flight, he said. The aerodynamic loads must be amplifying resonances we didn't predict. Sorley's eyes fixed on Smith. Mr. Smith, your calculations should have accounted for aerodynamic forces. How do you explain this discrepancy? Smith inhaled slowly, choosing each word with care. Sir, our models are based on static ground testing. At high speeds, two counter-rotating disks generate complex vortices that can't be fully simulated. It's possible that the tip vortices are interacting destructively, producing harmonic interference patterns. The explanation was precise, but it didn't ease the tension in the room. The officials weren't just hearing technical language, they were hearing cost, time, and political risk. Sorley folded his notes. We need to decide whether this program continues, he said flatly. Smith looked at the motionless propellers through the hangar's open doors. The evening light caught the polished blades, now useless and still. He could already feel the whisper spreading through the ministry corridors. Smith's stupid propeller has failed. Yet deep inside, the engineer in him refused to accept that verdict. The meeting dragged on into the evening. The smell of engine oil and cold steel thick in the hangar air. Charts littered the table vibration graphs, stress diagrams, and blade angle calculations that now looked more like evidence in a failed experiment than a blueprint for progress. Air Commodore sorely leaned back, impatience sharpening his voice. The question, Mr. Smith, is simple. Can this problem be solved in time to matter? Or do we cut our losses and move on to conventional torque reduction methods? Smith hesitated only a moment. Sir, I believe the concept remains sound. The vibration is mechanical, not theoretical. If we adjust the gear ratios and modify the blade twist, we can shift the harmonic frequencies away from the danger range. His tone was steady, but every word carried the weight of someone fighting for more than just a design. He was fighting for credibility. Chief Engineer Lithgow looked up from his calculations, cautiously optimistic. He's right, sir. The interference patterns likely occur where the forward and rear propeller wakes overlap. By changing the rotational speed differential, we can move that resonance out of the operational envelope. He flipped a page and underlined a series of figures. We can implement the changes in three weeks, less if we run the machine shop through the night. For the first time since the meeting began, the tension broke slightly. Sorley glanced at his pocket watch, then at the aircraft sitting behind them. The Spitfire's sleek lines gleamed in the lamplight, beautiful and stubborn. A machine that seemed to mock their indecision. Three weeks, Sorley repeated. No more. You'll have one additional test flight. If it fails, the program ends permanently. As the others filed out, Smith remained where he stood. The hangar grew quiet except for the tick of cooling metal. The twin propellers loomed above him like an unfinished equation. He ran a hand along one of the polished blades, feeling the faint imperfections beneath his fingertips. Every vibration, every flutter, every crack in his reputation. All of it traced back to these curved surfaces of aluminum. He thought of the engineers who had once laughed when he first proposed counter-rotating propellers. Too heavy, they said. Too complex. Too stupid. Yet in that laughter had been the same skepticism that had greeted every major leap in aviation. Smith exhaled slowly and reached for his drafting pad. The work would begin again tonight. Adjust the blade twist. Reduce tip angle. Recalculate rotational speeds. Shift resonance without losing torque balance. In the distance, rain began to tap on the hangar roof. A steady rhythm like the heartbeat of a machine waiting to be reborn. By March 1944, the hangars at Boscombe Down hummed through the night. Lathes and milling machines sang their mechanical chorus as Joseph Smith's team rebuilt the twin propeller system piece by piece. Every adjustment was measured to the thousandth of an inch. Smith barely slept. He pored over calculations until dawn, sketching new blade profiles on the backs of blueprints. The solution, he believed, lay in tuning the relationship between the two propellers shifting their rotational speeds just enough to move the destructive vibration bands out of the aircraft's normal flight range. The original Griffin configuration had the front propeller turning at 1,825 revolutions per minute and the rear at 1,475. Now, 
Smith ordered new gearing to bring them closer together, 1,700 and 1,500 respectively. It was a delicate compromise. Too close and torque balance would fail. Too far apart and vibration would return. The propeller blades themselves were reworked with a gentler twist toward the tips, each hand finished with micrometer precision. A fraction of a degree meant the difference between stability and destruction. When the work was complete, the Spitfire looked unchanged to the casual observer. The same elliptical wings, the same slender nose, the same graceful lines that had become a symbol of Britain's defiance. Yet under the cowling and spinner, everything was new. The mechanics wheeled the aircraft out into the open morning light on March 18th. Conditions were calm and clear, perfect flying weather. Smith stood beside the runway, hands deep in his coat pockets, eyes fixed on the aircraft that had come to define his career. He wasn't thinking about equations or reports now, just whether the new configuration would hold together when the Griffin screamed to full power. Squadron leader Wellam walked toward him, flight helmet in hand. Let's see if your stupid idea flies today, he said quietly with the trace of a grin. Smith only nodded. The Griffin coughed, then roared to life. This time, the twin propellers spun in perfect harmony, two blurred disks shimmering like mirrors in motion. The Spitfire surged down the runway and lifted cleanly into the air, climbing with effortless power. Smith held his breath as Wellam's voice came through the radio. Torque reaction minimal. Tracking straight. Climb rate steady. Pause followed. Advancing to 350, 370, 400. Everyone on the ground froze. The sound of the aircraft changed. Not the violent, shaking growl of the first flight, but a smooth, thunderous hum. At 420 miles per hour, the vibration that had once rattled the cockpit glass was gone. Wellam's voice was calm now, almost triumphant. Handling excellent. Aircraft stable at full power. Smith allowed himself a rare smile. Against every warning, every dismissal, every whispered insult in the corridors of the ministry. The machine now flew as intended straight, smooth, and terrifyingly fast. Yet even in that moment of vindication, Smith knew that the true test wasn't speed. It was whether the ministry would trust a radical idea long enough to turn it into production reality. Back in the hangar, hours after the flight, the air was electric with relief. Ground crews crowded around the aircraft as if touching history in motion. The Spitfire's twin propellers still glimmered faintly from heat, their blades unscathed. Joseph Smith stood to one side, motionless, his overcoat fluttering in the spring wind as the test pilot approached. She's smooth all the way to 440, Wellam reported, pulling off his gloves. No trace of the old vibration. She climbs like a rocket. I think we've just made the finest Spitfire that ever flew. Smith nodded quietly, absorbing the words. He had no need for celebration. The data spoke louder than applause. The instrument readings confirmed it. The modified Griffin engine now delivered uninterrupted power across the full throttle range. The contrarotating system had finally achieved what months of conventional design could not, harnessing brute force without losing control. By the next morning, the official report reached London. Air Commodore sorely reread the flight log twice before setting it down. The same engineer he had nearly dismissed three weeks earlier had now given the Royal Air Force a machine capable of matching anything the Luftwaffe could put in the air. The Air Ministry's reaction was swift but measured. The contrarotating propeller design, once dismissed as over-engineered, was approved for production on late-model Spitfire variants and the new Seafire XVs destined for carrier duty. In engineering circles, the breakthrough spread quietly but reverently. The system's advantages were undeniable, no torque roll, reduced takeoff accidents, smoother gunnery accuracy at high speed. Pilots reported unprecedented handling at full power. In controlled climbs, the aircraft could now exceed 470 miles per hour, a figure once thought unreachable for a piston engine fighter. The Spitfire, long considered near the limits of its design, had found new life at the edge of aerodynamic possibility. For Smith, vindication came not through headlines or medals, but through the steady roar of machines that finally did what he had imagined they could. Standing once more at Boscombe Down, he watched a line of aircraft take off in sequence, 
twin propellers flashing silver in the morning sun. What had begun as a stupid idea, whispered in workshop corners, was now official doctrine. A triumph of persistence over ridicule, calculation over instinct, and patience over pressure. The war would move on, new aircraft and new technologies emerging, but the principle Smith proved on that cold February morning would endure far beyond 1944. The contra-rotating propeller would become a hallmark of power and stability in the age before jets. As the last Spitfire disappeared into the distance, Smith turned away, the echo of the Griffin fading into the clouds. He didn't need to look back. History had already taken note. In the months that followed, the Spitfire MK-21 entered limited service, its sleek nose and twin propellers drawing second glances wherever it appeared. For pilots accustomed to wrestling their machines into the air, the new system felt almost supernatural. Torque had vanished. The aircraft leapt forward with the ease of a bird taking flight. Engineers who had once dismissed the idea as mechanical folly now quoted Smith's equations as doctrine. The British aviation journals that had mocked the twin propeller fantasy ran technical features on its precision balancing and efficiency at high Mach numbers. The true irony was that Smith's breakthrough arrived just as jet propulsion was beginning to eclipse piston power. In a few short years, the sound of propellers would give way to the hiss of turbines, and air combat would change forever. Yet the lesson of his work remained timeless. Progress rarely begins with certainty. It starts with defiance, with an engineer who refuses to accept that the limits of today must define tomorrow. When asked years later about that February morning, Smith only smiled. They called it stupid, he said, but it worked. His creation had turned Britain's most iconic fighter into a 470 mile per hour marvel, an aircraft that closed the chapter of piston-driven flight with unmatched grace and fury. As the Spitfire's silhouette vanished into the jet age, its twin propellers stood as proof that even in war's most desperate years, imagination could still outrun fear. If you enjoyed learning how engineering courage turned the Spitfire into a 470 mile per hour legend, there's much more to discover. Every design flaw, every sleepless night, and every test flight brought us closer to understanding how innovation wins wars. Subscribe to the channel and stay with us for more stories of forgotten inventions, risky experiments, and the people who refused to quit until they reshaped aviation history. What other wartime innovations do you think changed the course of history but rarely get the credit they deserve? Let us know in the comments, and join us next time, when another extraordinary breakthrough rises from the hangars of the past.